All right. It's so great to be here today again with Sherry Harkins, my art friend, and uh, she's also leader of a, a wonderful online art community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good to have you here, Sherry. And I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> so two places where art is being shown. One is, um, see, this whole wall is pretty empty. So uh -huh. I have, um, I had just had the opening for a show on Sunday. That was very fun. And then I have um, at the health and hospice, I have a public art, uh, some pieces at the health and hospice center. So that is really kind of nice too. Um, I'm excited to do that one. It's nice to have, um, you know, feel like it's sort of being used in a positive way. And mm -hmm. so that's good. Um, I ended up getting uh, a request to do the show that opened on Sunday um, because someone dropped out. And so I did the the gallery manager I think knows I have a lot of work because I spend so little time marketing <laughs> so <laughs> I had a lot of work on hand so it, it it looks they just did a beautiful job hanging it and uh but it's all portrait work and I wouldn't normally do portrait work for um a show because it's not really very saleable but um it looked nice and I just thought mm -hmm. okay what am I going to do because I didn't really have time to like prepare to paint for the show because it was it sort of came up just like a month before it was going to happen mm -hmm. and so I'm very happy with how it turned out and so we'll see what happens you know at least it'll give people a chance to see it and hopefully build my reputation even if uh, I don't have a lot of sales so was there a particular theme to the portraits were you doing portraits of famous people or just people that you no, or um, movie stars, or <laughs> uh, no, I was doing portraits um, that I used to do when my children were growing up. I did a lot of charcoal portrait work, and I, it's actually been something that has always resonated with me. Um, and then I stopped doing it. I started painting more seriously, like fifteen years ago, just because you're so much at the whim of the person that you're doing the commission for. Mm -hmm. But I really, I seem to have a little <laughs> bit of an affinity for portraits. And so I just started doing it again. And I really like doing people. So my grandchildren or my mirror often serve as the start of my um, my subject. Then it becomes um, something else. It's not really about them. It's kind of uh, about this particular grouping of pieces was sort of working through different things that come up kind of like journaling but um you know with ways that we still respond to the world but I had people of all different ages and different races and different sexes and um uh, in do, the show do you so. by any chance have any uh, photos of them that you could show if I put you on share screen uh I'm <laughs> sure I have I'm sure I do um, but let's talk for a few minutes and I'll pull them out. So yeah, the, uh, yeah. I, mean, I guess you could pause. That would be true. You could pause. Mm -hmm. I could show you some of them. Tell me well, about I'll, you. I'll and... just I'll just talk while you're saying that because that really resonates with me in terms of doing portraiture. Several things resonate with me. First of all, I, I grew to really dislike doing commissions because you want very much to make the person happy. And so it's impossible to just work with freedom <clears throat> because you're constantly thinking about what is it that they want? Or even if you can, even if they give you carte blanche, you're still thinking, are they going to like this? And, uh, and then usually the way that I worked with commissions was to say, um, you are not obligated to pay for this <clears throat> if it's not what you want. Mm -hmm. And so then I would send them a first draft and they would come back and say, well, yeah, but I would rather that it was like this or that or the other thing. And so then I'm doing these revisions. It's impossible to be paid adequately for a commission because I would end up spending three to four times as much time on it as I would if I were painting something that just sold naturally and organically. And 
at the end, it didn't really have any of me in it. Yes. And, and it's it's very disappointing to have work out there that isn't really from your own imagination and your own heart. Yes, you do understand exactly where I'm coming from. So, and and that's the thing because you don't, you know, you want it to be, so that's why these actually ended up being something that were reflections of things I had been thinking about or experiencing or things that I um, was sort of journaling through. So they all have some relationship to my own life, um, but they're, you know, they're really about other people uh, or something I hope that's not true. I shouldn't say they're about other people. They're hope there's something that I hope other people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Well, because there's a deeper thematic purpose to it, right? <clears throat> yep, exactly. Exactly. And just like when people read something that resonates with them, you know, uh, that, that may be something that they have, uh, had experience with in their own life, then that becomes something that resonates with them. So, you know, I hope that's what it, that's what it does. All right. Okay, I, gonna... I, I, I gave you the ability to share a screen. Do you have some photographs? I do. Yep. Let me just pull up this last one. Um, I should have, if I had gotten home earlier, I would have organized this better. My apologies that I did not. Um, okay. Well, I mean, one of the beauties of being able to talk over Zoom is that you can just run in from one thing and out to another thing. I, I, I spent an hour and a half this morning having a conversation with Michael Levin and Matthew Siegel, which was just off the hook. Uh, um, Michael Levin is the the developmental biologist that works in regenerative medicine and... Uh, xenobots and all these interesting things and Matthew Siegel is a philosopher who focuses on whitehead and process philosophy and so the two of them were having a really in-depth discussion and uh it was it was amazing so I'm looking forward to publishing that but but I just finished that a few minutes before I started this one and so I mean that's the beauty of zoom you can talk to people from around the world and <clears throat> from uh many different places in their day you know they can come in and out like i in the old days we would never have access to people like this because they would be busy with their lives and unable to physically go someplace else and have a conversation unless you could provide them with lots of money yeah pay their travel expenses and so forth and and to be able to just for free talk to people of that intellectual capacity and explore ideas of that depth is just beyond a gift i mean it's uh, it's just amazing and then then to turn around and be able to talk to you on the other side of the country <clears throat> yeah it is you're not by any chance coming to chino hills next week are you for the no i wish i could i have a few more weeks of uh the the job that i'm finishing uh -huh. up <laughs> um but i really wish that i could um uh -huh. I, I was going to ask you if you were going you'll be there Yes, I am going to be there, and Sevilla King is going to be there, and we're going to be rooming, so I get to meet. Oh, her. that's wonderful! <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about that's, it. Uh, I wish is, I could go. So, what's the title of this painting? This one is called um, "Grace Abandoned," and it is um, it's really sort painful. of about the, really the painful. Place. It is, yeah, it is yeah. kind of painful, but it's very much about the place that I feel like um, the world has been in the last couple of years with so much division and uh, people having a hard time having grace for one another and, you know, mm -hmm. being uh, responsive to um, one another with grace. So, um, mm -hmm. so that's what this one yeah, is ab abandoned, I think, is a is a terrific word to use here because it really does look like the the um, the child who's just been abandoned by by the parents <laughs> is in the same way that our world seems to have, or maybe more like a runaway <laughs> who has lost the parents because you know our, our world seems to have. Um, given up on our traditions 
mm -hmm. up our parents. Mm -hmm. um, I always like when Jordan Peterson talks about rescuing your father from the belly of the whale mm -hmm. as being a way of going back and bringing the traditions back into our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you can think of our traditional past as being our parent because yep. that's what we arose out of and yet we walk away from it and then end up all alone in a field like that and yeah desperate yeah. for comfort and hope yeah we it's such a strange time um you know people are i was I probably won't be able to say it very well, but just thinking about the, the things that are being celebrated right now, and even uh, even the 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 concepts and ideas and practices that people feel are virtuous. Um, I mean, and I don't just mean in sort of virtue signaling the way that that's occurring. I mean things like. Um, the our ideals are so confused you know um some of the some of the people that have been speaking lately about the idea of getting us to a place where we have ideals that uh at one time were celebrated like honesty or love or grace or mercy or kindness or generosity um are so missing you know we seem to be instead celebrating greed and um and you know, some sort of self-focused virtue. It reminds me of um, some years ago, I heard Francis Chan talk about um, Facebook and uh, Instagram and all of those. And he made some comment about the fact of, did you ever think like when we were, when we were all seeking to walk as people of faith years ago, that we would get to a place where it would be not only tolerated but celebrated that we would do things that were all about us you know that we would have like pages or um or uh just celebrate ourselves take pictures of ourselves constantly and <laughs> that be acceptable and mm -hmm. i i don't know about you i have such a hard time doing social media that's why i'm so terrible at marketing because it always feels like how can i you know this feels wrong to like look what i'm doing look at me look what's out here and look look what's um what's happening and i think i i think i react to that a little bit too much i'm trying to be in a place where i can think maybe the work that i'm doing has value for someone else and maybe it's uh something that they can relate to or that they can respond to or that they can see something in and then um have it resonate with themselves so yeah, I mean, absolutely. If if your marketing is focusing on the work, um, unfortunately, we live in a world where all the people who tell you how to market art will tell you that you have to market yourself, that what they buy when they buy your work is they're really buying you and your story. Yep. And and they want to have a relationship with you. And so then you kind of feel like you have to have a story and Right, am I right. going to make up a story or am I going to try to be authentic? You know, um, the thing, put another picture on the screen so we have something else to look at while I'm talking. Right. But um, right. the uh, the big the first question that almost everybody asks if I'm having an art show is, how long did it take you to do that? <laughs> and yep. that's such an empty question, right? Um, it it reminds me of um Henry Ford the the old joke about Henry Ford when he went some guy called him to come in and fix a problem in his factory his whole factory was shut down and he needed Henry Ford to look at his assembly line and figure out what was wrong and Henry Ford looked around and he touched something and poked something and like five minutes later it was up and running again and the guy said how much do I owe you and Henry Ford said well ten thousand dollars and he said, $10,000, you were only here for five minutes. Yes, but it, you know, it took me my whole life to know what button to push. You know? And yeah. and that's the way it is with art. I mean, some of my, some of my work that wasn't as great took weeks and weeks and other work that was um, really stunning, even to me, because mm -hmm. it wasn't really something that I necessarily did for myself. It just sort of poured out of me maybe took a half an hour mm -hmm. so if my if the 
if the uh, value of my work is dependent on how much time I put into it, mm -hmm. um, I'm in trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I can't charge enough for the painting that took four weeks, mm -hmm. right? But um, the work that went so fast was really coming out of all the experience and all of the training and all of the not just experience of painting, but all of my life experience and uh, all of that. So yeah, it took 30 minutes, but it was really based on 30 years. So anyway. Well, that is, I know, I wish I could paint faster. I, I, that mine do take a long time, but really that's because of working in oil and you know, oil just, mm -hmm. you have to plan for it and leave the layers and the space and the things you're redoing. So I'd like to I'd like to find a way to get a little more spontaneous, at least to mix that practice in so that I can manage both. Um, this is a really beautiful piece. What's the title of this one? Fishing for Men. Hmm. Do you want to tell me more about why you titled it that? Um well he's so different than me visually, you know, I mean, there's so many um, things that are not the same as I am, but this uh, combination of the way um, we are all related to one another and we're all connected to each other. Um, this one started with a, uh, a photo I saw, I was sitting in a diner in Brooklyn and this man was outside the window doing something and I just loved the image and so I started with that and then you know sort of shifted I changed what was in his hand my husband ended up doing a bunch of modeling for me because I was trying to get something right about it so you know he was really good at he's used to it standing at the counter doing different things for me so I could get parts of it um but I wanted to sort of talk about the brotherhood of mankind in this one. And uh, um, I hope that it reads as this is a man who's being contemplative and considering what he's doing. And I want it to be a little ambiguous. So we're not exactly sure what it is that he's doing or who he is or where he comes from, but uh, someone that we can all relate to as we begin to think about where is he coming from and what's he doing and so, um, and like I said, I want to have sort of all different people. So the show has people from different backgrounds and different experiences as a, as a sort of reflection of what we all have in common. So his hand is so, um, so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the skin tone is just remarkable. And, and I hope the viewers can appreciate when you look at him, his face and his hands, the skin looks completely natural. Mm -hmm. And yet if you stop and analyze it, that skin is made out of many, 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 many different shades and tones and hues. And um, you've got green and purple and, and orange and yellow and red and um, brown and gray and everything in there to make this skin and to me that's sort of a picture of just how complex life is mm -hmm. you know in the old days people used to buy a tube of flesh color paint you know? <laughs> but but if you try to say what flesh color is regardless of what color of flesh it is you know what whatever skin tone a person might have if you try to get that out of a tube it's going to look completely artificial, mechanical. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but to get real skin and, and to actually make it look alive and, mm -hmm. and the way that the light and the shadow hit on it and you can feel the texture of it and mm -hmm. uh, see the sensitivity in his face. And it's really wonderful. Thank you. That, you know, it's a cool thing. I remember, um, I don't even remember where I originally was learned this or was told this probably in school many years ago, but um, I always make flesh tone out of a combination of red, yellow, blue, and white. And mm -hmm. I think that that is so fascinating when you think about red, yellow, and blue being 
the primary colors and then you add white which is light you know mm -hmm. so um i think and then you can sort of go anywhere from there with you know you have the whole color wheel you have all the primary colors all the colors of the spectrum are right there in red yellow and blue and you can build on that to create your shadows and your highlights and the mm -hmm. things that you want to bring out and i just think i just remember finding out like realizing that's what i was doing every time working with the primary colors and i thought that is just amazing like how cool is that that in the image of god we're created and we are created out of the something that is the three primary colors and white. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, when you dig down into color theory very far, you start finding the meaning of the universe. <laughs> so... mm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I know you know that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll show you one more. This one is a... Uh... This one is, um, well, tell me how this reads to you because I am interested in your perspective. This is a very different style than how I usually work. I was actually doing a little experimenting with painting on treated paper, which I didn't like, but I thought the roughness of the way the paint application goes was kind mm -hmm. of interesting and went with this particular image, but Well, I, I, there's a lot of different stories in there for me. Um, <clears throat> the story that's top of mind, and I don't know if this is related to what you were going for at all, is that I think quite often the parent is having a very different experience than the child. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes me think about sometimes my, hus my husband loves to greet our dog in the morning especially by getting her to jump up and, and he grabs her hands or he grabs her by the face and he's, you know, <laughs> are you a good girl? And, and he's having a great time and he thinks the dog is having a great time, but I can see the dogs kind of <laughs> looking around. <laughs> like it's ears are kind of pinned back. <laughs> so, um, so I see the father being extremely happy mm -hmm. But the child is a little bit like kind of unaware of the father's happiness because the child's facing away from the father, right? Um, the child is um, much more contemplative and uh, mm -hmm. probably feeling safe in those arms, free to think a lot of different things, but not not feeling compelled to generate the same emotional experience as the father's is generating mm. does that make sense yeah I mean, I like you can see this separation like these are two individuals it's not a unit in other words mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. which i think a lot of times we make the mistake even as a parent of thinking that our child is part of our unit far too far into their future when the differentiation starts to take place the minute they're born and just keeps getting further and further more into two individuals rather than one. Hmm. Very well put. That's another thing I've been thinking a lot about. But I like what you said about the child not being aware of the father as well as the unit. It's it's a lot. I'm, it's a lot for me about um, who is the child looking at, like who's taking the photo and how does that um, interact or interfere with what's happening in the photo? Oh, how interesting. That is so interesting because we were just talking in this conversation I was having with um, Michael Levin and Matt Siegel about how <clears throat> Matt was saying any observation that a scientist makes automatically changes the nature of what's happening. And it has to be that way because <clears throat> in order to make a measurement or do an experiment, you have to use photons. You have to have light so that you can see what you're doing. And those photons get entangled with what you're working on. So automatically, no matter what you're observing, it's going to interfere. And so here you have a mother taking the picture and uh, you never step in the same river twice. Mm -hmm. And um, a, if there are two children in a home, ne both children have completely different experiences of that family because by the time the second child is born, the family is a different family than it was when the first child was born. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and the mother is imagining a certain relationship with that child, but that relationship that the mother is imagining is all tangled up with the father's relationship with the mother and with the child. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is this big complex um, relational thing, just like the universe. Very interesting. And that is a great connection to think about photons and entanglement. I wasn't making that connection, but that is really good. That makes uh, that fits perfectly with um, with what's happening here, which is, I'm going to show you one more from well, the show. Before you leave this one, I want to point something out to the viewers. Mm -hmm. I'm always talking about design. And mm -hmm. one of the important things about design is to have a value, a value pattern that kind of um, holds things together and also kind of guides the viewer to know where to look. And um, I see that Behind the figures, you have a value pattern that includes some white so that the um, the white of the father's shirt and the white of the daughter's shirt is not left just kind of um, pasted on the background, but there's white in the background as well that's touching both sides of the canvas. And so that white and the white of their clothing creates a, a value pattern of white against which you see the skin. And then the darkness of her eyes leads you right to her eyes, right? And then, mm -hmm. then this beautiful, um, I even see more of the connection of the father with the child in his hand because the hand is so expressive and the mm -hmm. colors in the hand are so rich. So mm -hmm. his hand connecting to her arm and then her little hand with her finger in her mouth leading right up to her eyes. And so you can't help but look at her eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> yeah, that composition playing together all yeah. those ways. Yeah. Great comments. This this other piece was um, I was thinking a lot about uh, patterns and um, see where I put it. I had it out here just a minute ago. There we go. Thinking about the way patterns play out in generations. And I happen to <laughs> see these three men. <laughs> and I just thought it was such a beautiful metaphor of generational patterns. So it's just a sort of funny, you know, uh, to me, it was funny to see them. Uh, they were actually dressed this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's yep. so funny. Because the young the young dudes are always insistent that you should never wear white socks with dark shoes. <laughs> so he's got his white socks with his white shoes. Then the middle aged guy is down to wearing white socks with his dark shoes. Yep. And then the old guy is like, you know, men shouldn't wear shorts. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes, yes. It was and it was so clear that they were related to me when I saw them standing um, that I was like, I'm going to see if I can do that. So this was a fun painting and then getting to in, include it in this idea of people and, you know, uh, what's happening um, was a fun exercise. Well, the other thing I want to point out here, and I was just thinking today about um, all that's involved in getting an idea from the idea stage into the stage of actuality, whether that idea is an architect's idea for a building and all that would be involved before the building is actually in built in brick and mortar and cement and whatever, <clears throat> or whether the idea is a painting. Mm -hmm. Even though you started here with a photographic reference, I'm assuming you had a photographic reference. <clears throat> Before you can begin painting, as you're looking at that photo, you have to solve all kinds of problems. And you have to decide how much of that background do I want to be explicit and how much of it do I want to be just implicit? And if it's going to be implicit, how do I make it so that it fits with everything else, but also pushes itself into the background and doesn't become obtrusive, but you can still get a sense of place and you can still see on the crosswalk the way that the light is is moving across so that you get a sense that they're in the light and which direction is the light going to come from and how much detail am I going to put in their clothing? And I mean, the number of questions you have to ask yourself before you can even start painting. And then once you start painting, other questions come up. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, that pole is there. Should I put the pole in or not put the pole in? And if I put it in, could I balance it with another pole on the other side? And if there's a wire hanging between the poles, should I include that wire? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all the time you're painting, you're solving all these little problems, trying to get this thing to come into being to say what it is you want it to say. Mm -hmm. But but the interesting thing is that somewhere inside your head before you started, that picture was already there. And you're mm -hmm. just sort of trying to get back to that ideal that was there before you started. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the whole process is fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that you're saying that too. Is it okay if I close it off so I yeah. can uh -huh. see? Um, I was thinking about, you know, I've been reading through Exodus for a long time now and continuing to think about it. And I, I actually... I actually have some dates for a show and some ideas and a few more connections. It's turning out very differently than I thought, but I'm, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But I um, I was thinking about Moses, uh, you know, something that struck me for a long time is this idea that he stopped to look at the burning bush and he observed it you know the scripture says that he turned aside to look and it says because he did that god uh used him in this purpose and so i keep thinking about it it's so fascinating to me to think like i i bet you do that too i i do that all the time i like look at things and somehow see something and it's um strikes me at whether it's three men standing at the crosswalk and mm -hmm. I see that there, there's something really interesting about this image the way it's working together or uh you know the one of the grace abandoned where that was my granddaughter actually being upset about something mm -hmm. <laughs> starting with that and then seeing like oh this would be a really cool painting but sometimes it's the way the light is shining through um uh, flowers or trees or leaves, or sometimes it's the particular color combination, um, you know, of that sort of rusty orange and the silvery green and the blue of the sky and all those things, whatever it is, there's something that strikes me that I turn aside to look because I'm like, this is, and then, and then I was thinking about what is it that I feel when I see those things? And it's really very much something that's transcendent. Like it takes me to a different space. It takes me out of my head and out of the things that I'm dealing with. Sometimes that's soothing because I'm struggling with something, but sometimes it's just that it it sort of takes me to another place instead of sort of this, you know, terrestrial world, this place I'm living, these things that I'm thinking, it brings me to a different spot, a different transcendent space. And so that's what I think as artists we're always trying to do, right? Is like, how can we invite other people into that? How can we share that that um vision with them and and i know from the people around me that that isn't something everybody does you know not everyone sees those things or is able to sort of um recognize when those things go by and i thought that's what happened with moses you know like he saw something and god said because you could see it i'm gonna use you in this way and so the particular way that he ended up shifting the world for Moses and giving him this whole other picture of what he was going to do instead of the Israelites being a, a slave people in a nation that was very powerful and intellectual and beautiful. They were going to rise up and do something else. And I thought about, I, I don't know if you do this, I bet you do, but when I'm having thoughts that are difficult for me, like if I'm struggling with something and, you know, if I'm having a hard time, my my go to um, thought process that gets me out of that or if I'm scared, if I'm, you know, awake at nighttime and I'm scared is I start thinking um, creative, <laughs> creative ideas like. Um, sometimes it's like where I'm going to put plants in the garden. Sometimes I'm rearranging furniture. Sometimes I'm putting together colors or patterns for different paintings. And it's so easy for me. Like it's one of those things that our strengths are our weaknesses because I can spend way too much time thinking about how I want to redo the house or, you know, something else instead of just being at peace with where things are. But it's... Um, 
it's a it's a great pleasure for me too. So uh, like it's just a fun thing to think about design and color and ideas. And I thought, you know, I bet that's why God gave Moses all those visions of the temple. That that was sort of his modus operandi too. You know, like he was a person who maybe went to the creative. He noticed this burning bush, and then God took him up on the mountain and gave him these images of what the temple was going to look like. And he came down and was able to share it with the people. So uh, I've just been thinking that in the last couple of weeks, do you think that has any validity? Well, what popped into my head while I, I can only tell you what popped into my head while you were talking. <clears throat> when, when Moses was looking at the burning bush, if I think about it as what, he, what he's really seeing there is um, another reality that's overlaid on our reality or what if, if whatever we're living in is not reality, I don't want you to call it, but there was a, there was another reality overlaid on our world. Mm -hmm. There was a picture of the ideal laid on top of our facts. Okay. Transcendent, a transcendent yeah. vision. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and they are, they were one because it was burning, but not destroyed. So, mm -hmm. So they're united this in that vision that he saw the ideal and the real or the real and the facts or whatever are melded together in that vision that he had. <clears throat> and the picture of the temple is a, is that same picture. It's that picture of the transcendent reality that, that needs to come into needs to be manifested in our world within our world and so to to see that vision is uh very similar to an artist having an idea and then that idea somehow has to become manifest in the world and in order for it to become manifest there has to be thinking through of the design and the plans and then there have to be resources made available and then the resources have to be tooled and and have to have human people working with the resources and, and and arranging things in order for it to actually become finally real in the world so it's much more of a process that people are human beings have to be connected to relationally in order to make the idea manifest right um mm -hmm. where the burning bush seems to be more of that just that just is a vision of what is it's all God made it already manifest. It's like God manifest in the world by his power, this vision. But when he gave Moses the vision of the temple on the mountain, the vision he's giving him is now I, I made the burning bush manifest in the world, but I want you to make the temple manifest in the world mm -hmm. because that temple manifest in the world is going to be a picture to the world of the temple that is to come because mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is the temple that is to come. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so by taking that idea, making it manifest in the world, it puts a, a substantive visual in the world for us to see, to imagine through like an icon, the temple is like an icon mm -hmm. of what is to come. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a portal that helps us to get yeah. there. And I think that's what I was thinking is when I was thinking about Moses, these were two different aspects of his personality that I could relate to, which was very exciting to me as an artist to think about. Um, certainly, I don't have a, a temple to um, create or to share the vision of, but what are the things that that come through in the thinking creatively, sort of doing that design when I, when my mind goes there and that's a sort of comfortable, safe place. Like, I don't think my husband ever thinks that way. You know, I don't think if he's like feeling concerned, he starts thinking about how to rearrange the furniture or where a new window would bring light in from the outside or um, how the light travels in the afternoon and what it will light backlight on the plants or, you know, none of that is sort of where his head goes. Whereas for me, it's always there. It's always present in the things I see. And it's so easy for me to consider. So um, I, 
I feel like it's a great encouragement from God to think that that, you know, could be uh, something I can share. That it's sort of a, you know, so I don't know if you feel this way. We, I think we've talked about it before a little bit. Sometimes making art feels so selfish, you know, it feels so like, uh, who am I doing this for? And why I, I love the process of painting. It's such a pleasure to me. So um, I certainly struggle with guilt and shame in my life about um, being self-focused. And so I think that is a way that the accuser of the brethren rises up. Like, who, who are you doing this for? And what is this important about? And why does it mean anything? And uh, aren't you just wasting your time being there in the studio painting? And couldn't you instead be out serving people at the soup right. kitchen? And, and exactly. uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But, but as you said, you know, each person has a calling that's individual to that person. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's complicated, but I have to say, I'm going to pray and ask God to give me that way of getting out of, out of my mental quandaries, because what you're doing may feel selfish to you in terms of spending your time thinking about rearranging the furniture or finding a new color for the garden, but it certainly beats going and getting a piece of cake. <laughs> um, it it's a more it's a more productive kind of addiction i guess mm, 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 mm. yeah yeah that's something to think about hmm. so are you still doing the the art group yep you folks yep, still, still meet every it. other week you do yep and what have you been talking about lately uh, actually, our last two sessions, Justin Wells. Um, the, oh, fun! He He's going to be at the meeting next week. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm sure what he does will be great. So he took us through um, a class that he's kind of prepping for on mm -hmm. the seven different narratives, and and that was really interesting. He said it was helpful for him to sort of get feedback and have people that were willing to engage in the conversation, mm -hmm. but. It was a great treat, you know, it was really, um, it was, he has, a, he has a YouTube series of that. I think mm, I'll, I'll mm. link to that. I will link to that. Um, cause yeah, I watched some of those and I just thought they were excellent. Mm. Yeah. And we have a couple of, um, of, uh, film people in the group too. So a couple of them had been talking to him about, uh, going out and working with them. I don't, I don't know if they have their tickets and are able to do it or not, but, um, I heard him speak yesterday, I guess it was, or recently on Paul Vanderclay about, mm -hmm. um, about looking for some people to film mm -hmm. with them. So I don't, I don't know if they ended up doing it, but uh, it's so cool to see the connections being made, you know? Now, did you invite him to come to the group or had he joined the group previously and then just was one of the people who shared what he was working on? Yeah, he started coming a couple months ago. I think, I can't remember how, um, how or why, if he happened to see something um, where I had been speaking, you know, an older thing where I had been speaking mm -hmm. with you or Paul or something else. I don't know how it came about, but he uh, just emailed me. But there were a couple people there. Maybe there was a replay because there were a few people that uh, emailed me one week. Um, actually, I think it was because some of our people some of the people from the group were speaking with Paul and mentioned it. And so a couple of people had uh, emailed me and said, could they join? And I said, sure, um, of course, you know, so we had a couple new ones. It's sort of always fluctuating, you know, there's a few mm -hmm. people that have been there from the beginning, but I would say most of the original people are not there anymore. Um, there's still a strong, I think, contingency on Discord. I'm I'm not on Discord. So there's a whole other like, you know, relationship thing that happens over there uh, where those people are connected. Um, but there's I, I'm saying there's not that many. There's probably there's probably five or six people that were there from the beginning. And then other than that, it's sort of always flowing and changing and people come in and people drop off. And sometimes I feel like the the bartender in the old westerns you know like <laughs> sort of manning the bar and people are coming and going and but it's great i i love it i learn so much i 
uh, am so appreciative of the opportunity to talk to people and, you know, discuss different ideas. I think our next meeting we're going to be doing, um, I haven't seen it yet, but um, Jordan Peterson spoke with an art critic recently. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. I haven't. But no, I, I haven't seen anything he's done for several weeks because I've been making far too many notes for my conversation with Levin and Siegel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ended up I don't with know 30 how some, do it. I ended up with 30 some pages single spaced of notes of things that I just felt like I had to talk about and then I had to scale it back to two or three questions that I asked during the time so that they could talk to each other because that was the whole point of the thing was to let them talk to each other um but the whole time they were talking my mind is just filled up with all these things I've been studying and so anyway all that I can't wait to hear it is it do you know when that's going to air well, I'm trying to decide. Um, I could publish it tomorrow, but I'm not sure how good things do when they're published on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could publish it this afternoon, which sometimes Friday afternoon is not such a bad time to publish, but I think Monday is gets more viewers if I wait and publish. I mean, the first burst gets more viewers because algorithm is funny if you don't get a big burst of viewers at the beginning it just drops off immediately <clears throat> oh. and it doesn't even put you out there anymore mm. and then mm. the other weird thing that's been happening lately is um i've never gotten dislikes before but all of a sudden i'm getting pounded with dislikes uh -huh. and when that happens that reduces your percentage of likes on the video Cause not very, I mean, most people don't bother to hit the like button. So maybe you only get eight likes or something, but then if you get two dislikes, now mm -hmm. you're down to 75% on that video. When you have mm -hmm. a 75% like to dislike ratio, then the algorithm just cuts you off at the knees and you, it doesn't go out there anymore. So, That's very um, strange. Do you think people are just being mean or do you think it's bots or what do you think is happening? Well, the first time it happened, it happened when I was doing, I did that four episode reading of um, Whitaker Chambers book Witness. Mm -hmm. And um, and I did that because I'd been doing quite a bit of traveling and I wanted something that I could still have as material out there, even though I didn't have all the time to have conversations with people. And, one, and the first time, so that ha happened, I actually got on Twitter and I said, hey, if anybody could go over there and like that video and try to pull the percentages back up, it would really help me. And somebody jumped in and who had seen the video and was on Twitter. And he said, I think it's because you're just reading this book and it's not as engaging as when you're talking mm -hmm. to somebody. Mm -hmm. So I thought, OK, well, that's possible. But then like three more episodes down the road, it was a regular conversation that I was having, which got great comments from people. So I'm assuming people really liked it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I got hit this with this barrage of dislikes. And so mm -hmm. it's the first time it's ever happened. I've always been at almost a hundred percent likes mm -hmm. for five years now. So it was weird. So I yeah. don't know. I mean, yeah. there may be, maybe because I'm getting older and I don't look as good as I used to. <laughs> I have no idea what it would be. Mm. <clears throat> I remember one time a while back when uh, Glenn and I were having a conversation about something. Somebody jumped in and said, two doddering old fools who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, I mean, there are always those people out there. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, people are so mean nowadays. I mean, that so that there is a very real truth not because you're old or anything like that but just because somebody takes pleasure in being rude and mean you know it's just mm -hmm. so unfortunate it's such a, that it's such a weird weird world we're living in how do we get to that place where we can be kind and compassionate and loving and put all that out there uh well i mean people people complain and say it's because it's an you can be anonymous right but right. yeah i think it was bill hybels who wrote the book who you are when no one's looking if who you are when no one's looking is is uh, vile and unkind, and then there's something seriously wrong with the culture. Mm -hmm. It's a whole culture. If, if if just by becoming anonymous, we can become who we really are. Right. You know, then who we really are is, as a culture is 
pretty scary, right? Yeah. Yeah. People are not keeping it in check. There's no reason to. I know I don't think people should be allowed to be anonymous. I just think it shouldn't be something that anyone can do. And then I think people's behavior would be a lot better because the more we feed that wolf, the worse mm -hmm. people get. And, you know, that is uh, not a good thing. So, well, but on the other hand, we're at the place mm -hmm. now where if you if you're not going to be anonymous and you're going to be somebody, then with the potential for deep fakes, you have to be able to prove who you are and that you're actually the somebody that you say you are. And then mm -hmm. the only road to get there is with a, a universal digital ID, which I'm not so excited about, but that's what they're yeah. saying is going to be necessary because of all the deep fake problems. Mm. So mm. I think the world is going to be changing in very unpredictable, well, may, maybe very predictable ways in a very short time. And I don't think anybody's really prepared for how fast it's going to happen. Yeah, I think, I mean, right. Jonathan always says when we're in this inversion process, but when it happens, it's going to just go nap. Yep. <laughs> and we're yeah. going to be like, <gasps> yeah. in the blink of an eye, right? Yeah. 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 Well, we can pray in the meantime. Yeah. That all yeah. things happen as God intends. There's so much that has come to light that uh, through this process that has so many dark sides. So um, mm -hmm. God is in control and we can trust him and continue to look at him and seek uh, to be and do and respond as he calls us to. Mm -hmm. Something I, I'm i always uh, aware of is... Um, I so often I feel um, that I could be offended or, you know, hurt or um, do battle with something. And I don't know if you experience this, but I constantly am thinking like if, if there are entities that uh, are seeking to divide our culture, <clears throat> how can I respond to this in a way that doesn't make space for that? And it helps me to, um, at least sort of be the observer a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. To step outside of the circumstance and um, and then not let it take root. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, it's not easy, <laughs> you know, it's not always easy, but. Well, I mean, I find that I'm, especially when I'm in, if I'm in flesh and blood conversations with real people, embodied conversations where I'm actually there, mm -hmm. which makes me in many ways much more accountable than I am when I'm, Mm -hmm. on this screen right mm -hmm. i find these thoughts running through my mind and, I, and i'm just sitting back and observing the thoughts that are running through my mind i'm thinking i must be a terrible person inside somehow to be having this thought that i'm having right now about this other person that i love and care for and i'm having a conversation with them and yet i'm sitting here and these thoughts are running judgmental critical thought mm -hmm. like you know, but but I've I've often heard it said that um, the enemy can cause thoughts to run through your mind, but it's only when you let it build a nest in your hair or you let, you let it lodge and, and then you ruminate on it and you let yourself take pleasure in the thought. That's when the problem begins. Right. So yeah. so in many ways, we can be observers of those thoughts and we can recognize Maybe what that thought is telling me something is about myself. Maybe it's a mirror to me to see I'm having that critical thought about that person because maybe it's something in me that I'm actually critical about. And maybe I could work on myself in that area mm. and try not to be that person, mm. you know, so you can learn some things from those thoughts that roll through your head, but you don't have to let them lodge and take root. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but if you, if you take it too seriously, it can really just take you down in a hole and make you think that you're just worthless and unforgivable. And, you know, yep. you should the be locked up somewhere. Brethren, right? Right? The accuser makes us uh, feel ashamed and yeah. um, like we don't have value. Yeah. And it's interesting to think about being the observer again and entanglement and what do we allow ourselves yeah. to become enmeshed in you know we're yeah, back to yeah. that idea it's very yeah. very interesting to me to think about that yep yep and and so 
and and I find if I can if I can do that if I can just let the thing kind of wash through and and uh, not let it lodge that very soon it just abates it's a, it's like anybody who's just poking at you if they can't get a response out of you they'll eventually give up and go away right and and i think what's that's that the scripture way resist mm -hmm. the devil and i said what's that scripture resist yeah. the devil and he will flee from you draw yeah. closer to yeah. god and he will yeah. draw closer to you yeah that's right yeah or even if when you're having a conversation like that if you just can bring the conversation around to get the Lord in the center of the conversation or, or be focused on how can I, how can I be the, the loving individual in this situation or whatever. Mm -hmm. So hard, easy to say, and so yeah. hard to do sometimes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's no question about that. Um, and, and of course, much of it makes so many things come in there. Like if you're tired, if you're having a bad day, if you've already been, like offended 15 times before you got into this situation and you managed all those times, but now that's just like one thing too many, right? I mean, there's so many things that can tip the uh, balance on something like that. But, but all of that is a recognition. I mean, first of all, it's a recognition that our father knows all about this. Mm -hmm. And he loves us and he is there to be our encouragement and our helper and our guide. And um, because when we, when we can operate out of a base of trust and joy, it makes a lot of that stuff um, inconsequential, right? Yep. When we trust that we're enough and that we're loved and we can have that grace towards ourselves, then it's so much easier to do it towards other people. Yeah, that's really well put. That's, I think that's the story right there. That's the narrative. That's, that's mm -hmm. one of those seven narratives. Yeah, right, right. That's right. <laughs> but that's probably a narrative that hardly ever comes out in, uh, in American drama or um, Netflix or. Mm, yeah, that's true. Right? It's true. Have you read much um, George MacDonald? You know, when I was a new believer, I read everything by George McDonald I could get my hands on. And back mm -hmm. in those days, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, maybe Kevin Phillips or something like that, who did a popular series of George McDonald's books um, translated into contemporary English. Because, mm -hmm. you know, George McDonald uses a lot of transliteration of the, the brogue and the... Mm -hmm. the the language of um these books take place in scotland or ireland scotland, scotland. yeah mm -hmm. so that scottish dialect is very difficult to read and so you can get kind of hung up on it and so mm -hmm. he did this whole translation of turning it into he used a little bit of the dialect at the beginning to just set the tone but then eventually it goes away and you're just reading it and you you feel like you're in scotland Mm. But, and I, there's probably a half a dozen or a dozen of those of his novels mm. that I read. And they're just, they're transformative. I mean, when you dwell in that world with him, mm -hmm. it just changes the way you see the world completely. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and then I, I also, I haven't read it for a long time, but I had a book of George MacDonald quotes that C.S. Lewis had gathered mm because C.S. Lewis always said that George MacDonald was his mentor. Yeah. So I, I used to read those quite often. I have a poem by George MacDonald pinned in the front of my Bible. Oh, cool. <laughs> All that mm. stuff. So what were you going to say about George MacDonald? Um, well, I have uh, my brother-in-law um, passed re recently, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, he, and he was a huge George MacDonald fan. So he, was diagnosed almost uh, about 20 months ago with mm -hmm. cancer. And we didn't actually think he was going to have that long. And so we had almost 20 months and did very well. But interestingly, he got super um, open to the visual arts, uh, in particular, you know, painters um, in the last six months of his life. Um, and he 
he's was 10 years older than my husband who was a couple years older than me so and he was the oldest in his family and um uh in the beginning of our I mean I've known him since I was in high school you know like a long time so we've had a very long relationship and you go through a lot together as a family um but he was very interested in George McDonald and read everything and you know was a little bit um in his sort of own enchanted world all the time about things and I could never really get into it but as he was kind of developing this big interest in painting I wanted to re- try reading something that I had read earlier as a way of connecting with him. So I had hoped that we would get to spend some time together this spring. The last time I saw him was in November, but um, I've spoken to him on the phone a few times since then. And I mean, I saw him when he was on his deathbed. We were able to, he doesn't live near near us. He's about nine hours from where we live driving, but um, we were able to visit with him on the last day of his life. Amazingly, God worked that out. But anyway, it's just very, I, I've been thinking a lot about what it was that he connected with and what it was that he saw. And uh, I've been reading Fantasties. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and I think it's Scotland after I said that. I thought, is it Scotland or Ireland? I, I have it in my head that it's Scotland, but maybe that's just where where I'm thinking about it. So I don't find it as um, transparent as like the Chronicles of Narnia or other writings of C.S. Lewis, where you can sort of automatically see the um, the metaphors and the things that are being spoken about. But I'm, I wish I had someone who could sort of explain to me. There's different things I pick up, like this whole shadow self, I think is very interesting. And I find it to be so dense with imagery that I have to pay really careful attention um and well, I I never read Fantasties or or what's the other one not Pinky some any of the fantasies I never read any of the fantasies I only read mm -hmm. the novels gotcha which is a different thing because the right. novels are stories about real people mm. that had real experiences in real mm -hmm. families and um I remember one of the novels is about a, a young guy who became a tutor in a in a wealthy man's mansion who had a big library. That's all I remember about it is, is mm -hmm. that that's kind of the setting for the novel. Uh, another one of the novels was about some threadbare pastor in a small village. Um, another one of the novels was a little bit similar to kind of a Heidi thing about a young girl that was up in the mountains with, hmm. you know, a, a farm. And um, another one was about a young man who was handicapped, I think. They're just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. it, because it's just real people, but they're living through real experiences. And then the way that he brings about the relationships and uh, the atmosphere of the whole thing and brings faith into it in a way that's not cheesy you know I mean I hmm. think so often when books are really focused towards faith they can mm -hmm. be not very well done but but yeah. all of his novels were are just radiant well it's interesting because the fantasy though at least the one I'm reading doesn't talk about faith at all so um, but the worlds that he's creating I can so understand how C.S. Lewis would be connected to that and I think Tolkien was very um, influenced by his writing as well so I can see how that would happen but the imagery is overwhelming I mean it's like psychedelic it sounds like um, mm. it sounds like he's on drugs honestly <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and read it I guess <laughs> I would love to talk to you about it if you do, because I, I'm kind of plodding through it. Um, I have to find, I, ha I find I have to be super focused when I'm reading it, because if I don't create the pictures in my head of what he's writing about, I quickly, my mind wanders to something else. But if I can stay with it, it's really fascinating, but it's so maybe enchanted or transcendent or something is the word. I, I don't, I'm not sure. It's just so otherworldly, you know, it's very mm -hmm. interesting, but um, I wish I had somebody to sort of talk with me about it and say, this is what they're referring to here, or this might be somewhere he's going. Um, 
I'm going to have to see what I can find about. Uh, well, I think with any of these books that have a world building thing that takes place at the beginning, mm -hmm. you might have to really plow through for a long time to get to the place where it becomes natural to be in that world. Yeah. Like just recently in the last few months, I reread that hideous strength because mm -hmm. that was a very important novel to me when I was a new believer 40 yeah. years ago. And, um, and then I also read it probably 20 years ago, but even reading it this time, it, it was a slog for the first hundred pages to just mm -hmm. get back into that world that he's building and to get the, the drift of the environment and of the people and until you're sort of living there. And then once mm -hmm. you're living there, then it, you, you sort of become embodied with it. And then, then it all falls into place and then it just, you know, then it's so compelling. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that, I think, is I don't remember having that difficulty the first time I read it. Mm -hmm. I think it's because we are so visually oriented now mm -hmm. that the movies and the TV series, even taking books that that we've always loved and they just lambast us with these visual images right away. I remember thinking this like 40 years ago, I was reading Ben-Hur and the first 50 pages of the thing is just setting the scene. And you're just like, get on with it, get to the mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. because we don't have to set the scene anymore because we're mm -hmm. used to having these things right in front of our face that set the scene for us. Mm -hmm. But, but those people who were writing then they're, they're building a world so that you can see what they see. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've outsourced that to the movie makers. Yep. We're probably not seeing what the author saw when we outsource it to the movie makers. Mm -hmm. But if, if we engage with the author, then that whatever that in between space is between the author and me is going to get closer to what that ideal vision is. Right. Mm -hmm. Then. Um, so anyway, hang in there. Yeah, yeah. I guess if C.S. Lewis found it valuable, there must be something worthwhile. In there. Right, right. Yeah. And even slowing myself down enough to take it in is important. You know, it's so important. I, I think I talked to you about this last time, too. I'm trying not to listen to very much because my mind is just always racing in too many directions. And mm -hmm. I can kind of rein in the where the plants are going or, you know, how I want yeah. to arrange the furniture. I can rein that in a little bit, but the more that is, I'm just multitasking in my brain too much. So I'm um, mm -hmm. trying to be quiet and make space and not always succeeding often. Well, especially if you're painting this kind of work that is so contemplative, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, your, your work is, is filled with your, thoughts and your embodiment and your faith and um that requires you to protect your space your internal mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. good that's well put thank you yeah an encouragement to do it well you you know i haven't been painting for a long time and part of it probably is because my internal space is all clogged up with this other mm -hmm. stuff and yet i feel compelled to do this so um yeah so, so what what are you thinking about? Like, what are the new ideas that are hitting you in another way and the things that are striking you differently so, than they have before? Here's all the notes that I had for this thing I did with <laughs> Levin and Siegel. And I realized, I mean, after I got it all written and I was reading through it and circling things with red ink of what I thought was essential, and I ended up circling almost everything, um, I realized there's no point in trying to talk about all of these ideas with these people because they they have busy lives and to be able to talk this through is probably uh even take these 30 pages of notes it's probably a six episode thing mm -hmm. what i need to do is find another conversation partner explain to them here's this paragraph I'm thinking about here. Let's parse this out. Let's try to really analyze it. Let's try to really see what's going on here because 
in preparation, I went back and just randomly picked five pages out of Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. Mm -hmm. Because that that's always, to me, there's always so much overlap there with everything that's going on in the world. And out of that five pages, I just saw Whitehead and Michael Levin just popping up over and over and over again, even though they're not in his book at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful to just find somebody to have this conversation with me and we could look at some of these things. Like maybe I can give you an example. The notes are scattered everywhere now because I was trying to keep track of things. Um, here's, here's a quote from Whitehead. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. And then Jordan Peterson goes on to say, every moment of threat is simultaneously a moment of opportunity. The change that upsets the presently predictable and orderly also means potential or advancement into a more promising future. The unexpected is information itself, information necessary for the constant expansion of adaptive competence. To me, that was a perfect description of what Michael Levin is doing. Um, here's another quote that I had picked up somewhere from Friedrich Hayek. Have you ever done any economic study? Mm -hmm. Friedrich Hayek, uh, was a student of Ludwig von Mises in Austrian economics. Mm. And, uh, but I just want you to listen to this quote as if it doesn't have to do with economics. Just imagine that it scales into everything, art and Jordan Peterson and Michael Levin and everything. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Okay. To the naive mind that can conceive of order only as the product of deliberate arrangement, it may seem absurd that in complex conditions, order and adaptation to the unknown can be achieved more effectively by decentralizing decisions and that a division of authority will actually extend the possibility of overall order. Hmm. So for example, let's take Moses with his um, instructions from God about the temple. Mm -hmm. Now you might think the best way to get that temple made is for Moses to build it himself because he's got the picture in his head, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in actuality, it's impossible to build that temple by yourself. So you have to be willing to decentralize to delegate the authority the options and so forth to a, a number of people but then can you also decentralize the authority mm -hmm. can you also give um agency to the people who are doing the work and say the idea is that we're supposed to have pomegranates around this this mm -hmm. uh, corbel that's uh, along the top of the temple um do I micromanage and I say that pomegranate has to be five centimeters high and, you know, half a centimeter deep, or do I allow the agency of the people to figure out how they're going to do these pomegranates? And all they have is they need to know that it's got to be four pomegranates around, you know, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you can decentralize authority. Mm -hmm. And that when you do the that, ideas that they bring in, Hmm? may be better and the ideas that the yes. other people with agency bring in may be much better than the ideas that we had to begin yes. with and and eventually you're going to get a much more beautiful orderly mm -hmm. uh final property than you would if you micromanaged everything from the top mm -hmm. which is, i mean that's we know that from government mm -hmm. we know it from economics because um, a market with millions of people making personal decisions is a very good indicator of how the market actually works. Whereas if somebody from the top tries to tell you what the price of nails should be, 
your society is going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So we decentralize um, decision making and we end up with a better order. Mm -hmm. But that's also true of these cells. Mm -hmm. Somehow in a, in a developing organism, there's a cell and then there's two and then there's four and then there's eight. And then I don't know how many it gets to while they're still undifferentiated, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, they're not undifferentiated anymore and they go off and do different tasks. But that's a decentralized vision, really, because mm -hmm. where is the impulse coming from? And yet, ultimately, with all that decentralized decision making, you end up with a body that's got two arms and they're both the same length and the same number of fingers and um, a bilateral, you know, er everything works out. So there's something there. And, mm -hmm. and I just think this kind of stuff scales everywhere. And mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that I would love to talk through, but there's no point in me talking to Michael Levin about it, or even maybe not even Matthew Siegel. I just need to talk it through myself because I have so many of these. I just have quotes everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and it seems like there's some combination of both the agency that the individual cells or the individual people have, as well as the so, sort of overarching authority. Like, it feels to me like it's a combination of both, you know? It has um, to be. I think yeah. often about the Renaissance, I mean, just as one time period, and I'm sure there were many others, but how new ideas sort of, you know, poured out at that time so that people began to, I think about it from the artistic perspective when, you know, all of a sudden people could see things from three dimensions and knew how to recreate that. And certainly we can see dimensionally, we can see one and two point perspective when we look at the world. So people weren't doing that before though. So did their vision change or was it just that they had the formula, even without the formula of how to create something and with orthogonal lines and vanishing points, you can still see it. And yet everything was much flatter before. So somehow the knowledge of all the people working together, scientists, mathematicians, artists, what, what all the, that, um, the, the different people who brought their own agency and their own abilities to that whole created this new birth renaissance, new experience. So like, is that where we are again, you know, and is that something that, that is happening right now? So the, or even think about the printing press when that was so scary for people to think about the printing press or scripture and what would happen if everybody had their own Bible and everybody could interpret it themselves. And yet God worked in the midst of that to do something amazing and wonderful. So I, I kind of hold on to that now in thinking about where the world is, you know, God is certainly in control so if we if we look to him as the authority and then everybody is bringing their gifts um, to that, their agency, but it's just so scary because we have no control over what's being brought, right? But God does. Well, so that brings up one of the last things that Levin talked about. I asked him about it because I had heard him talk about it in another video. He was talking about the... Um, the two aspects of control and relationship. And uh, I think that fits in exactly with what you're saying, that we'd like to live in a universe where we knew exactly what to do. And, and we pretty much would have to do it because then we wouldn't have to fall short. We wouldn't have to feel guilty. <laughs> we wouldn't have to have um, alternate ways of managing our emotions because we would just get busy and do what it is we're supposed to do. That would be easy. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's the nice legalistic framework. Just mm -hmm. tell me what to do and I'll do it. Right. Which is why people so often do that in the church because they want to yeah. know what the rules are so they can yeah. follow them and then get to the other side. Yeah. That's the control paradigm, right? Um, but in in both of those illustrations that you used, both the symbolic, I mean, the um, perspective example, and then also um, 
what was the second example that you gave? The printing press. The printing press. Both of those, even now, can be analyzed from both sides. And you can show the upside and the downside of both of those things. Um, first of all, the perspective thing, I think, must have been something that got that other decisions were made during the Middle Ages about not using perspective for a reason. Right. Because right. the Greeks and Romans certainly had perspective. I mean, they were able to carve beautiful, perfectly beautiful three-dimensional objects. But you don't see it in the two-dimensional work. You know, you don't see it in in the paintings. You see it in three dimensions. But, but are there two. are there many paintings surviving from the Greek yeah, Roman days? Right, there's, right. there's the about the only thing that could survive from back then, just because of the length of time and things degrading, are the mosaics. Right, right. Um, it's much more difficult to convey form in mosaic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and there are. Even today, there are good artistic reasons for not using form and for allowing background and foreground to merge mm -hmm. and to have flat surfaces. Very good artistic decisions can be made based on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the, the second one that you talked about, which again, I just lost. The printing um, press. The printing press. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, even uh, was it Marshall McLuhan? or some other thinker talked about how even, even before we got to the printing press, just getting to the place where we had the written word in many mm -hmm. ways um, is outsourcing our memory to a piece of paper mm -hmm. where prior to that memory was relational mm -hmm. and had to be passed on and you had to pay attention you had to remember, you had to use your cognitive forces for all this remembering. And mm -hmm. uh, that when you outsource it to clay or paper or tablets or whatever, scrolls, whatever it might be, then we could get lazy on that score. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is now you have more mind share mm -hmm. to use for something else so that you can, you, you can move further along and progress in some other area. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the printing press, now, now there's no longer um, any guard at all on how far this printing thing can proliferate, you know. And that, so there are really good arguments about why maybe the printing press wasn't a good idea, mm -hmm. and yet so many benefits came out of that. So, so what you see in all of this is that control could never work. Mm -hmm. Top-down control could never work because there's too many aspects of every single thing. It's the combinatorial explosion thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be relationship. And this is why now when Levin is talking about relationship, he's talking about something else. But mm -hmm. I just think this control relationship paradigm is so interesting when you think about what it means to have faith. It's not like we wake up every morning and God tells us what to do. If you don't continue the relationship on a regular basis, then your spirit is not open to whatever guidance might be coming. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to recognize when you miss the mark, mm -hmm. right? Because that relationship is, is there, then you're not going to get the guidance that you need. But at the same time, if you can keep that relationship vital, mm -hmm. then there's a possibility for this distributed intelligence or this distributed authority to build, you know, to be the body of Christ and mm -hmm. to have right, all the right. different parts working together and all in relationship with the head. Mm -hmm. and does that yeah. make sense? It does. Yeah. It makes, it makes great sense. And interesting that this is something that's being impressed on your heart from all these different sources. And yet, uh, making well, that's sense. all like I can see when I when I watch Michael Levin all I can see is just I mean this this whole paradigm of the reason art fascinates me as this paradigm is that they're always talking about all these problems these problems about that can't be solved by physics because of this or that and I'm like it wouldn't be a problem if you could recognize that this is all a work of art mm, yeah. the whole universe is a work of art mm -hmm. and there's an artist and there's an idea Mm -hmm. But that idea is being worked out through this process of this continual 
um, relationship where like when you're, when you're painting a painting and you make a stroke and you look at that stroke, now that stroke is changing the way you see everything else on the canvas. So now, now you're making another stroke and then those two strokes are relating to each other, but they're relating with something else over here. And so it's this continual process. It's not like the artist just says, oh, there's the painting. I'm going to just paint this thing like this. No, you have this continual relationship. You're looking at what you're doing. It's speaking back to you. It's having an effect on the choices that you make in the future, right? This whole, and so I, I just see the whole universe that way. Mm -hmm. It's this work of art, but then every single agent in the universe is also working on its own work of art mm -hmm. and, and, and all of those are working not based on rules, but on principles. And those principles yep. have this flexibility and adaptivity in them. Fractals, I wish right. there was some way I could describe what's in my head to people, but I mean, it's yeah. just... It's like fractals, right? Yes, like exactly. That, like yeah. Down further and further and further. Yeah. But it yeah. all, to me, it all operates on principles that are these kind of sliding binaries. Mm -hmm. um, and not not strict rules. It's not a system of control, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is it's kind of encouraging to remember. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about we we say God our Father, a mm -hmm. father can't operate with strict controls with his children. There'd be no relationship in the first place, and the child would never grow, mm -hmm. or develop, or learn. Mm -hmm. Or, or be prepared to do anything on its own in the future. Yeah. So why would we think that our father in heaven is any different? It, he would be even better than the best father, human father, right? So mm -hmm. there has to be some analogy there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that, uh, the painting of the father with the daughter too, and the, all the different relationships that are happening within that image and, and the eternity that also exists within the father to the daughter, to the daughter, to the son, to the daughter, mm -hmm. like all of that whole process and how each one affects the other. All right, well, this was great. I should let you go. My head is very full with lots of things <laughs> to think about. And um, I would love to talk to you again. Not You got, in, you got not me going too, too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, may, maybe I'll I'll try to get hold of Fantasties and read part of it and see what we can do with it. That would I'm be having great. the same problem. Trying, I've been trying to read Jonathan Strange and Dr. Norrell because everybody's telling me what a great book it is. And I love Piranesi so much. Piranesi is Susanna Clark's second book. Huh. Um, it took me a while to get into the first time I read it too, but then I, you know, by the third time I was reading it, it's like, this is like peaches and cream. It's just so delectable, hmm. but I, but Jonathan, Nor Jonathan Strange and Doc, Doc, jo Jonathan Norrell and Dr. Strange is okay. her first book and it got all kinds of awards, but I just can't get past the first 30 or 40 pages. I, I keep trying and I'm, I'm going to go back and try again because it's supposed to be an amazing book. So, all right, I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Well, read Piranesi first. It's such a, okay. such a joy and it's a lot shorter. Okay. That's a good idea. I will do that. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank I, you. I hope yeah. you got all your, oh, you said you wanted to ask people about works of art. Oh yes. Yes. For the Exodus show. Um, yeah. Oh. I don't know how to do it quick. Just I've been working for a long time on putting together a show based on Exodus. So I'd like to do a call for art. No, um, no cost to this. I will have information. Um, I need it by June 23rd um, in order to put everything together. It's going to be a virtual show. So I am creating a virtual video of all of the work. Um, it, it just needs to be connected. I will send you something that will be a link so people can find out more information if they're interested. That would be terrific. But, yeah, I might even have some stuff I'll put. Oh, I would love that. Virtual, if it's a I virtual. I would love show. that. And I'm also I'm also very interested in sharing it. So we're going to do a um, at my.
pretty big church. We're going to do a, like an opening night and show it on the big screen and have uh, some of the people that are there talk about it. But I'd love to have that. I'd love to have it go other places if I can Uh pull it off the way I hope to. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah. So be great to talk. Maybe after we do the show at my church, I can talk about the next call and share that. But Uh anyway, we'll see. It's taken a long time and it's changed direction many times and looks very different. I initially thought we'd have a, uh, you know, an in-person actual object show. And it seems like this is going to be the way it goes, but this is what's happening with many uh, gallery shows nowadays. So I will send you a link of some kind so um, people can find it. And uh, if they're interested, I'd love to have any work and I'd love to have your work. That would be super great. So Have a great day. Thank Thank you, Karen. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.